The Science of Salvation, number one, by A.T. Jones, Friday evening, February 12, 1897. Everybody knows that this is a very scientific age, at least in name, in profession, and in aspiration. God wants his people always to be up with the age. More than that, he wants his people always to be ahead of the age. Particularly, he wants his people always to be reformers, and for a person to be a reformer, he must be ahead of the age. Then, as this is a particularly scientific age, in profession and otherwise, God's cause, his people, must be scientific to meet the demands of the age. That is the statement of the proposition to the study of which I invite you tonight. The Lord wants you and me to accept that proposition, to study it, and to build upon it until it is demonstrated in us before the world that that proposition is scientifically correct. If you and I, if all who profess the name of Christ do that, then whether you and I have a part in it or not, because if you and I do not have a part in it, those will have a part in it who will follow the Lord to make that demonstration by them. And if you and I will not allow him to do it, we miss it. But you say, salvation is the work of God's people. Salvation is the one cause of the Lord. This is what these other brethren have been saying. This is what we had in the lesson this afternoon and what we have had in all the lessons in Hebrews. It is the lesson we have had in other places in the Scripture. And the Scripture says that we are not to know anything but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You say that, yes, and I say that. I say that the work of the people of God, all that the cause of God is in the world, is the work of salvation. And this exactly agrees with what we have stated already. Therefore, salvation is science. More than that, salvation is not simply science. It is not simply a science. It is the chief, the key, the center of all sciences. It is the most scientific of all things that are dealt with by the minds of men in this world. So that when God's people take the salvation of God as it is in God, when his cause of salvation in the world shall stand representing indeed his ideas of salvation, then there will be revealed to the world the science that is above all other sciences. Then God's people can stand before the very kings of science and not be ashamed in a scientific age. Now, I am thoroughly committed to that truth, and I want you to see how completely it is the truth. You and I are committed to the salvation of God, and I want you to see by the Bible, the book of all truth, that salvation is science. Then you will, with me, be committed to that truth. First then, I want you to think soberly and see for yourself not only that salvation is science, but it, that it is the highest of all sciences. The word science means literally knowledge. The science of botany is the knowledge of botany. The science of astronomy is the knowledge of astronomy. So that one scientist has defined science to be the product of thinking. All the knowledge, the science that the world has of astronomy is the product of of the world's thinking on the subject of astronomy. Now, salvation is the knowledge of God. Quote, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the living and true God, in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Close quote. It is therefore science. But this knowledge is not the product of man's thinking. It is the product of God's thinking. For, quote, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, 
neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Close quote. Therefore, salvation, being the product of God's thinking, is not only science, but it is the highest of all science. Again, that which is recognized by the world as science, the natural sciences, is the product of men's thinking. It is with the mind that men think. It is with the mind, then, that men deal with all these sciences. But salvation deals with the mind itself. Which, then, is the higher? Which is the higher? That which deals with all other things, or that which deals with that which deals with all other things? The latter, to be sure. Then, as with the mind, men deal with all other sciences, and salvation deals with the mind itself, it is perfectly plain. Not only that salvation is science, as certainly as any other science, but that it is higher science than all other sciences. It is the highest science that can be known to the mind of man. Yet again, salvation deals with the mind. But who is it that in salvation and by salvation deals with the mind? It is God himself. Then as it is God himself who works out, who makes known this science, and as this science is the product of God's thinking, it follows that the science of salvation is the highest, the deepest, the broadest science that is known, not only to the mind of man, but to the whole universe. Let us read a few scriptures. Quote, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, verse 2. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. Romans seven twenty five. We know that the Son of God is come and hath given us a mind, we have the mind of Christ, close quote. The only way the Lord can reach us is through the mind. He deals with us only through the mind. He governs us only through our minds. Look, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And the first of all the commandments is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The carnal mind cannot be subject to the law of God, cannot be, must be changed, must be exchanged for another mind which always serves the law of God. That change of mind is salvation. That renewing of the mind is wrought by God in the work of his salvation, and it can be wrought by no other. Therefore, it is the highest of all sciences, the highest that is known to the mind of man, the highest that is known to the universe. Do you not begin to see why it is that the testimony speak of the science of salvation? Now, I want you to see that others think so too. I want you to see that I am not alone in this. I want you to see that for this position, we have authority, scientific authority, that is, the authority of persons who understand science. If I could bring to you tonight evidence that those who understand all other sciences the best of anybody in this world testify that they are more interested in this science than in all the sciences put together, that they see more in it worthy of their consideration than in all the other sciences put together, would you not say then that I am safe in talking as I do from a scientific standpoint? Well, I have just such a company.
a company that understands all other sciences, and I have the evidence truly stated that they are more interested in this than in all others put together. In 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, the apostle is speaking of salvation, and there I read as follows, quote, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Close quote. What things do the angels desire to look into? The salvation of God when it is preached with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. The Greek word for desire here means to set one's heart upon. And the Greek word for look into means to stoop to a thing in order to look at it, to look at it with head bowed forwards, to look into with the body bent, to look carefully into, to inspect curiously of one who would become acquainted with something. Such is the attitude of the angels toward the subject of salvation. Now, do the angels understand other sciences, biology, geology, astronomy, all other sciences? You know that they do. Everybody knows that the angels understand thoroughly all other sciences. Everybody knows that it is perfectly safe to say that all the angels understand all other sciences infinitely more thoroughly than any man understands or ever understood any one single science. But the angels are more interested in the subject of salvation than in all the other sciences. They who know the most of all others are most interested in this one. Oh, well, you agreed with me a while ago that if I could cite such authority as that, you would say that we were safe in taking this position. Come along then. We are safe. We are in the best of company. Yes, the best of scientific company. There is authority that is conclusive on the subject, scientific authority. Now, I am not making a play on the word science here tonight. I am using the words science and scientific with reference to salvation as an absolutely truthful word. The salvation of God is truly a scientific thing, not falsely so-called, but genuinely, supremely scientific. So do not get the idea at all that I am making a play upon the word science or scientific. I am using it truthfully because it is correct in this connection. But this is not all. Not only do the angels desire to look into this as those who would become acquainted with something, but they do become acquainted with something. They do learn by looking into this and studying it. Turn to Ephesians 3, verses 8 through 11, and you will see this thought expressed. Quote, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all, I leave out the word men because that is supplied, see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent, look now, I am to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ in order to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which has been hid in God, and that is to the intent for the purpose that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known 
by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Close quote. What is the intent of making men see this? In order that the principalities and powers in heavenly places, in heaven, other translations give it, that is correct, may be known the manifold wisdom of God, the angels, the principalities and powers earnestly desire to look into this gospel of salvation when it is preached with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. They do look and study, and as they study, they learn new revelations of the wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God, according to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know by other scriptures that this mystery of God, this eternal purpose, is revealed in the gospel. You know the principalities and powers in heaven are not eternal in one way. They are not from eternity to eternity. They are from a certain point to eternity, as you and I are. Gabriel is to eternity only from the point where he was created. He is not from eternity to eternity. But God is from eternity to eternity. Now, from eternity to eternity, there was, there is a purpose. His eternal purpose, which is purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. How long will it take the angels to get to the depth, to exhaust the study of that eternal purpose? To eternity. That is plain enough. Then, as that purpose is revealed in the gospel, is made known through the mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, it is plain enough that the angels are studying it. And as they look into it, they see there revealed the manifold wisdom of God according to his eternal purpose. They desire to look into it. They do so and thus learn. Well then, as they understand all other sciences more than any man understands anyone, when they are more interested in this than in all the others and learn from this, is not that a fact upon which you and I can with safety trust ourselves? Then is not this too a subject more worthy of our thought, our highest thinking, than all others put together? And cannot we set our hearts upon this and give our whole soul to it without being unscientific? Oh, we can, we can. Let us do it. Now, do not misunderstand me. I'm not making an attack on other sciences. I'm not saying that all other sciences should be ignored and counted as will-o'-wisps and unworthy of any attention. No, I am saying that this is greater than all of them, and that whatever we study in them must be studied in subjection to this which is greater than they. I am saying only that all others must take a secondary place, at least to this one, if we would be scientific. Now think of it. Take our own natural minds with which we deal with other sciences. Would I, would any man, be strictly scientific to put his best and highest thinking on a science when he had the highest possible authority that there was a higher one at his hand? Would that be scientific? No. Well then, we see so far that this is a science, that it is the highest science than any man who does not put his highest thinking, his best thinking, and all his powers upon this science first of all and have it lead all other sciences. In the nature of things, he is not scientific, and he is not wise either. For what is this science? Salvation. Very good. And it is eternal life. Suppose I put all my life, all my powers, on all other sciences, to the neglect of this, or holding this as inferior. Do I get it? No. How long shall I have then? 
to study the other sciences, at most only a few years. Then my work upon these sciences will be done forever, and I shall never have a chance to study them any more. But if I take this one, first of all, and let the others take the inferior place until I get this one secure, then I shall have a chance to study the others? Yes, how long? To eternity. Ah, is not that the wise way then? Is not that the only wise course? And is not that the only scientific and sensible course? Certainly it is. Come then, let us be scientific, strictly so, supremely so. Now let us look a little further in that first passage that we looked at about the angels. It began with the prophets, thus, quote, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently and prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. When they testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and of the glory that should follow. Now, by the prophets was brought forth in writing, as we have seen, this science of salvation, this product of God's thinking on the subject of salvation, this book of science, this book of salvation came by the prophets. Did they know anything about other sciences? Yes. We can find this in a number of places, more than we would have time to notice tonight. But we will look at two or three points that we may get before our minds the fact that they did have a knowledge of these. In the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, there is a scientific statement that was made about 1,700 years before it was discovered by science. It was there all these ages, but the scientists in whose field it was did not know it by the process of their thinking. It is the statement of a truth in astronomy. Whoever believed the statement in the Bible knew it all the time, of course, even though he never heard the word astronomy. But the science of man did not know it, and discovered it only after so long a time. Another thought. When that Bible writer made that scientific statement, which 1,700 years afterward, scientists found to be scientifically correct, was it not just as truly a scientific statement at the time as it was after the discovery of it? Assuredly. Then was it not that when the writer wrote it? Certainly. The passage is... 1 Corinthians 15, verse 41. Quote, There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. Close quote. That was now known 100 years ago, because about that long ago, a man who considered himself an astronomer and was so considered amongst his fellows criticized that statement as being incorrect and as being an evidence of the ignorance of Bible writers because he thought, that is, the Bible writer thought, that one star differs from another star in glory, in brightness, instead of in distance. That is the statement of this critic about it. His idea was, as he spoke for the science of astronomy, that the only reason why one star is to us brighter and more beautiful than another, is that one is nearer to us than another, so that we get more of its light. But today, in all the realms of science, it is known to be the truth that there is as much difference in the stars, in their grandeur and beauty and tints, as in the flowers upon the earth so that if we could see all the flowers on the earth set before us in our grand field with all their glory and variety of tints, and then can see the stars of the heavens as plainly as we would see these, we should see one just as variated and as beautiful as the other. This is known now, but it was not known when that passage was written to the Corinthians. Now I ask, was not that a scientific statement? Was it not the statement of a truth in science the day that Paul wrote it and sent it to Corinth just as certainly as it is now? The discovery that science made that it was the truth did not make it the truth, nor did it add a particle to its weight as the truth. 
their discovery simply showed that they had found out something that was true, but which they did not know before because they did not believe the Bible. If they had only read that in the Bible and believed it and accepted it, that point in science they would have known long before any scientist had discovered it. There is another science. Sir Isaac Newton one day was sitting under an apple tree. An apple fell from a branch near him. Many times apples had fallen from trees before. He had seen apples fall from trees before, but that day he was in a meditative mood and he began to think, why did that apple fall? It must be because the earth had some influence on it to draw it to itself. The earth, being larger than the apple, would draw to itself when it came loose from the tree. He said, if I take that apple and I throw it as high as I can, it falls again to the earth. Then if it was the influence of the earth that brought it this little distance, when I throw it as high as I can, and it comes back again, that is proof that the influence of the earth reaches that far away from the earth and holds to that thing and brings it back. If I could throw it a mile high and it should come back, then it would be plain that that influence reached a mile away to bring that thing back. Then he said, if that is the truth, that influence ought to reach to the moon. I wonder if it does reach to the moon. I will go and see. He went to his house and he sat down there took the astronomical calculation upon the orbit of the moon in its place and worked out a long series of figures. But they didn't fit. He tried it over and over again, but they didn't fit. He couldn't get that influence to reach the moon. He laid the thing aside for about 10 years, if I remember correctly, before he took it up again. One day, there was published a new calculation of the orbit of the moon, correcting some inaccuracies in former figures. When that was published, Newton said, I wonder whether that will supply what I want. He got the figures, went to work, and worked a long series of figures that you and I would be astonished at, of course, but he came down at last within two or three figures at, of the end, and he saw that it was going to fit. He was so overwhelmed with the wonderful fact that he could not finish his figures. The pen dropped from his hand, and he had to ask a friend to carry it out for him. The friend did so, and Sir Isaac Newton had demonstrated a scientific fact, or rather a new science. It is called gravitation, and he has been immortalized ever since. That was indeed a great thing. Yet that was in the Bible, 2,500 years before Sir Isaac Newton discovered it in nature. Gravitation is simply the balancing of the universe. It is that principle, that law, as scientists would say, by which the balance of the universe is maintained. That is, each body in the universe influences every other body and is balanced with it. Not only each body, but each particle of matter in the universe attracts and influences every other particle of matter in the universe. In the physical world, that is simply the corresponding fact to what we have had in the Bible class this afternoon in the matter of life. We found that you could not touch anybody or anything without it being known throughout the universe. A sparrow does not fall without your father, and that a sparrow does not fall without your father, and that sparrow does not fall without its fall being felt throughout the universe. This is simply a corresponding fact with that. There's a spiritual fact there also corresponding to these two. Quote, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. 
Close quote, Psalms 139, verses 7 through 10. When you and I think a right thought, is it discerned anywhere else? We think a wrong thought. What is a wrong thought? Sin. Where does the sin begin then? In the thought. Is my sin discerned any place else in the universe besides myself? Who discerns it? God by his spirit. Oh, then, is there a spiritual fact in our universe that is not discerned, is not felt, or a thought for good or ill that is not felt? Do you not see gravitation as a science then? Sir Isaac Newton discovered a truth in the universe which corresponds to all of the truths of the universe. The law which Newton discovered is, as I have said, that by which the balance of the universe is maintained. Now I will read the scripture that shows that this was known 2,500 years before Newton discovered it. Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with a span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Close quote. When the mountains and hills were set, they were balanced with one another. Did God fix the thing so that their balance would be maintained? Was it the scientific name of the law by which the balance of things is maintained? Gravitation? Of what, then, did Isaiah speak? Of gravitation? Certainly he did. A scientist illustrates that fact by the little flower called the snowdrop. Think of two kinds of flowers that reproduce themselves from the seed. One is a standing flower, the other is a drooping flower. You have noticed in flowers little spindles standing around a central one. Now, in a standing flower that reproduces from the seed, the central spindle is always shorter than the surrounding ones. If it is a drooping flower, the central spindle is longer than the surrounding ones. The reason of that is that the flower dust, pollen, that is upon the surrounding ones must fall upon the central one or there can be no reproduction of the flower. Now, in a standing flower that breeds from the seed, this central spindle must be shorter than the others so that the pollen of the others can fall upon it. If it were longer, you see the dust would fall below and miss it, and so no seed could form. If it is a drooping flower and this spindle is shorter than the others, the dust would fall away and again no seed can form. So then, in every standing flower that is reproduced from the seed, the central spindle is shorter than those surrounding it. In every drooping flower that reproduces from the seed, the central one is longer. The snowdrop reproduces itself from the seed. And though it is a standing flower, yet the central spindle is longer than the surrounding ones. How can this be? I will state it again so that you may get the point more clearly. The snowdrop is a standing flower properly and reproduces itself from the seed. The central spindle, then, should be shorter than the others, but it is longer. How, then, can it reproduce itself from the seed? The Lord has provided for that. He has fixed it so that, though it be a standing flower, yet it shall bend and droop. Therefore, the central spindle is made longer than the others in this a standing flower. It grows up and stands straight until it blooms and is ripe and ready for reproduction. Just then it droops its head, and when the pollen has fallen to its place, the little flower rises again and stands. Now that is beautiful in itself. But here is where the illustration of the law of gravitation comes in. This scientist tells me that what causes the flower to droop, to bow its head, is the attraction to the earth. 
That is correct. What makes an apple fall? Weight. But weight is simply gravitation, from the Latin gravus, signifying weight. What makes that standing flower droop its head? The weight of the earth. But why does not the weight of the earth make that flower droop its head before? Ah, when God made that little flower, he balanced the earth. Yea, he balanced the universe to its needs. When God made that modest little snowdrop, he held the universe in a balance and fitted it to the need of that tiny flower. And if God take thought of that tiny flower, shall he not much more take thought for you, O ye of little faith? Now this scientist tells me that if the earth, and of course the universe, had been made a single pound or a single ounce heavier than it is, it would have been made the snowdrop droop before the right time because being heavier, it would have had more influence upon it. And in that case, the first snowdrop would have been the last. But that little snowdrop might live and cheer mankind to the end of the world. God fixed the universe just exactly to the needs of that flower, so that when the exact time of its need comes, the weight is exactly sufficient to draw it over. Then, as it hangs, that reproduction may take place. Other strength is coming in from the roots, and the stalk becomes a little more stiff, and the flower overcomes gravitation and stands as before. Quote, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with a span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Close quote. Who set the balance of the universe? God. Isaiah stated it nearly 2,500 years before Isaac Newton discovered it. Was it not a scientific fact when Isaiah wrote it? Yes. Was it not on record all those ages? Yes. Was it not a scientific truth all the time? It was. Was it any more scientific truth when Newton discovered it? No. Scientists learned something that they did not know before. But there it had stood in the Bible all the time. Think on these things. God wants us to. He wants you and me to see that the salvation, the word that he has given us, and to which he calls our highest thinking, is not some little narrow side issue, but the greatest thing the world can ever know. It is the greatest thing the science of the world could ever know. It is the chiefest science that the world can ever know. Yet we are not to study it to be scientific. We are to study it to be saved, and to be saved is scientific. This is the end of Jones's sermon, The Science of Salvation, number one.